title of this message is From Death to Life. I titled this message that way because that's who God is. He's in the resurrection business. Can you say amen to that? That's what God does. He restores marriages. He delivers people. He sets at liberty those that are bruised, bound by the enemy. That's just who God is. I don't care where you are in life. I don't care what's happened to you. I don't care how deep in the pit you are. God is able. Let me say it again. God is able. And we've seen God do it over and over again. Verse 20, as Jeremiah is writing here, the weeping prophet, he tells us that he is in distress, so much so that he says, my bowels are troubled, my heart is turned within me. Now, he has explained in verses 1 to 19 why this distress, why is he in such turmoil? And then he gives us what I think is the final result of everything that has happened. He says at the end of verse 20, at home there is as death. May God add to the reading of his word. So for the last four weeks as we've we've gone through this series, we've been looking at Jeremiah's description of what has happened to cause this death in the home. He tells us that the people had defiled themselves with immorality, that they had fallen into sin and they were doing things that God had forbid. They were doing them anyway. And now the Bible uh, describes them as a people lying in the gutter with no one to lift them out. Then Jeremiah begins to describe the children And this has really been my focus this whole time, as having no future. And it gives the reason why, that they had been captured and taken away by the enemy. Now, this shouldn't have surprised them, because Jeremiah had warned them. God had sent the warning through this prophet, and he warned the people what would happen if they disobeyed God, if they walked in their own ways. We find that warning in Jeremiah chapter 6. Will you turn there with me? Jeremiah 6, and I'm going to start with verse 10. And in a moment as we read this, I want you to look at this with new eyes. You have to look at this with a new lens, and I'm going to tell you why. Remember that a prophet, not just they don't just foretell. Foretell means that they'll tell future events as God would uh, open that up to them and give them revelation. But remember a prophet foretells. Now what does foretell mean? It means that they will give us warnings, pictures, and how God deals with his people when they do things their own way or when they disobey God. But he all, they also comfort and strengthen God's people and tell them what will happen if they turn, if they will repent, if they'll begin to follow the Lord. Remember that Paul said that all of these stories were written for our admonition. They were written for our learning. He tells Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed, given by inspiration of God. And he said, listen, this is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In other words, what Jeremiah is saying is not just a story of the past church. It is a story of the right now. And the warning that God would give his people then, God is giving the warning to us now. So you've got to look at this with a different lens. You've got to read this in a different way. And you've got to know that God is speaking to the church, speaking to God's people. He says, to whom can I give warning? Who will listen when I speak? Their ears are closed and they cannot hear. They scorn the word of the Lord. They do not want to listen at all. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads And he says, look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. 
But you reply, no, that's not the road that we want. I posted watchmen over you who said, listen for the sound of the alarm. But you replied, no, we won't pay attention. Now, church, I'm going to tell you that message is speaking to us. God is giving the warning, and he's saying to the church, listen, you're at the crossroads, whether you believe it or not. You're at a place of decision in your life and in your family. And God is saying, listen, don't just make your decision based on emotion. You look around, he says. You look at what is happening in the marriages, and look what's happening in the families. You look at what the enemy is doing as he's attacking the family like never before. And God is saying, listen, you've got to make a decision. You can either continue to follow the ways of the world, but I'm going to tell you that that road leads to death. Or you can get off that road and you can get on God's road and that leads to life and that leads to peace and that leads to strength, church. And that's where we are today as a, as a church, as a man and a woman of God, as a family, as a marriage. We are at that crossroad. The question is, is will we listen? Will we finally get to the place where we say, you know what? This life of compromise that I'm living today is not working. Will we get to that place where we say, you know what, God? I'm going all the way in. I'm going to do everything you tell me to do. I'm going to live in the way that you tell me to live. Knowing that we are eternal beings, church. We're not a body with a spirit. We're a spirit with a body. I know I keep uh, harping on that with you, but church, you're going to live forever. The question is not if you're going to live forever. It's where you will live forever. That's why I'm going after God, church. I want to be with him. I want to be with him forever. I want to serve him forever. I want to rule and reign with him forever. Can you say amen to that? And that's that's why I feel like God is just screaming today because we look at the world. We see what's happening in the world. And church, God is giving the church the picture of the end times and saying, this is how it's going to be. But I warned you. Will we listen, church? Oh, we just turn a deaf ear to God once again. Live our own way and do our own thing. But I'm going to tell you, church, if you're on that road, you're on that road of doing your own thing, listening to the world, you're on the wrong one. And that's where the warnings come in. It's time to do things God's way. The question is, is if we do, Pastor, can we turn this tide of death? Can we see a marriage turned? Can we see a family turned? And, of course, Pastor Joycey, uh, what a beautiful testimony to prove what I'm saying here today, that it just takes one. You'll find that out in a moment. And you can take the most dysfunctional family and see that family turned, and now that family's on fire for God. So the answer is yes, church. But I'm going to tell you, it's not going to happen by accident. We're going to have to do our part. There's some keys that God would give us through his word, and that's why these prophets would foretell and foretell. That's why the Bible was written, because God was trying to show us through a pattern, through pictures, through stories of how God deals with mankind. And church, this is one of those stories. Can you say amen? So we looked at the very first message about saving our kids. Man, we got to save our kids. I think one of the greatest scripture verses, of course, is where Paul says, listen, don't be deceived. Evil company, evil communications corrupt good character. And man, I I was showing you through those, the tape measure, the incredible influence that's taking place on our children and where that influence is coming from. And I'm going to tell you, it's not coming from the church. It's coming from the schools. If they're in a secular school or I call them indoctrination center, uh, they're not being taught higher learning. Uh, they're, they're being taught immorality. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is today, whether we like it or not. We then looked at destroying dysfunction. How do we di- see dysfunction destroyed? And if you were not, did not hear that message, you need to listen to that. We talked about raising good and godly kids. I didn't say perfect. 
because probably this morning some of you parents wanted to kill him again. <laughs> but you can raise good and godly kids that make good decisions. And that's not impossible. And today, again, I want to talk about the power of God to take death and turn it to life. And I'm going to show you some very practical things. And some of you might say, well, Pastor, this is very simple. But again, don't let the simplicity go over your head. Follow me. Hang on to me because I believe the Holy Spirit is going to speak some beautiful truths to you here today. Number one, if you're taking notes or if you're on the church app, you'll find the very first point, and here it is. Renew your commitment to Christ. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. We have already gone over this scripture, but I feel like it's so important that we need to do it again. And I feel like it's a description of what we're faced with today as believers, not just our marriages, our families, but us individually. There is a storm, church. It's not brewing. It's not coming. That storm is here. It is here. Can you say amen to that? Verse 24, the words of Jesus, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon that house. But what happened? It did not fall, for it was founded upon a rock. But everyone that hears my sayings and doesn't do them, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the same storm came, the same floods, the same winds, the same beating upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I really feel, church, that this is one of the greatest keys to a healthy and a happy marriage and home to living the abundant life and the life that Christ came to provide. It is when God's people will begin to live God's Word. Not just on Sunday mornings, but every single day of the week, every moment, doing your best to do what God tells you to do. Because in these verses, God is saying, if you're going to stand this onslaught, if you're going to take the attack of the enemy, because that's where the enemy is right now, it is a supernatural attack. You better look what's going on behind your marriage. You better look what's going on behind your kids, what's going on in your home. You better look at when everything begins to go crazy. And I'm going to tell you, you'll find an enemy who wants nothing but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's Scripture. Again, whether we like it or not, we have a real enemy. And he wants to bring us down and bring that marriage down and bring that family down. But church, if you've got the right foundation, then it doesn't matter what he does. It doesn't matter how much he comes against God's people because the rains can come, the floods can rise, the winds can begin to beat up on the house. But Jesus said, if you'll do what I tell you to do, it will stand. Amen. So there's no doubt, church, that we've got to have the right foundation. And that foundation comes from just doing what God tells us to do. This means that my life and my marriage and my home has got to be built on Christ and his word. Now you say, Pastor, I already know this. Tell me something new. Well, hang on a second, and I want to just share with you what God gave me in such a powerful, powerful way as I was putting this together. And he gave it to me because not everybody, uh, not every couple in a marriage, not every marriage is serving the Lord. I mean, there, you're going to have one couple that's serving God and the other one's not. Or you can be in a family where it's just you, like Pastor Joycey and her family got saved. And she was obviously the only one saved at that time. She began to talk to her family about coming to the Lord. And so you will say, well, Pastor, how can I build the right foundation when um, I'm not united in my marriage when it comes to the things of God? Or how can I build the right foundation when I'm the only one in my family serving the, the Lord? Well, I'm going to give you the answer, and this is so deep. Are you ready for the deepness, the depth 
of this revelation. So what do you do then when you're the only one? Here's what you do. Here it is. You serve the Lord. You do it. You begin to, to uh, renew your commitment to do it God's way. You be the example. You be the person that prays. You be the one that reads the Word. Uh, you don't worry about what everybody else is doing. You do it. Now, why is this so important, Pastor? Let me tell you why that I really felt God gave this one to me in such a powerful way. I can tell you the number one conversation in the first night of counseling when a couple is having problems. They'll call us up, say, Pastor, we need to come talk to you. Great, get on over. The moment that that couple will sit down is the moment that they'll begin to puke on each other. And they'll begin to puke on me and Sharon as we begin this time of counseling. And always, always, church, and it's never not happened in all the years that I've been in ministry, always it is something wrong with my spouse. There's something wrong with the dude. That's why I'm here, so you can fix him. Because he is absolutely the problem. And they bring out a list. I mean, they come out and unroll that thing. There's got to be a hundred things on there. Something's wrong with my spouse. It's never anything wrong with me. I'm good. I got my act together. Always it is the spouse. And here's what's going on, church. Couples think that if the spouse gets right, then everything else in my life will be right. Do you know how many couples that I have met, how many individuals that I have met that their wholeness and their wellness is totally dependent upon what their spouse is doing or not doing? I've said this over and over again. If your wholeness is dependent on what your spouse is doing, you are not well. There is no doubt something wrong with you. And here's the result of thinking that my problem in my life is my spouse. Here's exactly what happens. You will begin to beat them up. You'll begin to harp on them. You'll take Scripture, and man, you'll lamb blast them. You'll call up the prayer connection, and you'll tell the prayer connection, listen, my spouse needs Jesus and needs him now. And all that time, that one thought is about you, what you're doing, how you're walking this thing out in your life. And every single time, church, I'm going to tell the, that couple, and I'm telling you the same thing that your spouse isn't the key to change. You are the key to change. You see, church, if I will live for God, if I will do what he says to do, if I will let the Lord change me, God, help me to become the man of God that you've called me to be. If I will see this change in me, church, I'll see the change in the marriage and in the home. That's why Psalm 139, 23, 24, the psalmist said, Lord, search me and try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Not one time did he mention anybody else. Everything was pointed at him. And that's where God is saying and what he's saying to us and to the church. Listen, start praying that God would change you. God, help me. Give me the strength to live the life that you have called me to live. Help me to do what is right. Help me to be the spiritual example. Because the more we allow God to change us, the more changes that we will see around us. Can I say that one more time? The more you allow God to change you, the more changes you'll see around you. Here's what I'm saying. Even if nobody else does, renew your commitment to Christ. 
Go all the way in with him. Follow him. Renew your commitment to living for him. Just go after God. Don't worry about your spouse. He's got a Savior too. And it ain't you. His name is Jesus. Now, are you saying, Pastor, don't pray for him or her? No, I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is start including in your prayer time, God, change me. Let the changes start with me. And that's what I've prayed all this time, Lord. Lord, change me. I've got things in me that you need to help. I've got things that are wrong, church, that I need God to help me with. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. This is why we're always praying. God, search me, know me, try me. Amen? Now you say, well, pastor, what about a couple? If you're both serving the Lord, you're sitting here today as a couple, I commend you. I commend you. But I'm going to tell you to renew your commitment, both of you, to Christ. Renew your commitment to praying together. Let me ask the couples, do you pray together? I've often said the couple that prays together stays together. Do you read the Word together? Do you have devotions together? If you don't, renew that. Start that back up again. Begin to say and make a declaration to God that, you know what, God, my home... As a couple, we're not going to allow the devil in any longer. He can't come in through the books. He he can't come in through the movies and the music and the games. It doesn't matter what it is. Renew that commitment to making your home a home like Joshua said, as for me, my house, we will serve the Lord. Make it a place that honors Christ. He's the center of the home. Because I'm telling you, church, we need it. We need it. Can you say amen to that? As you do, you'll see death turn to life. Number two, renew your commitment to communicate. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to look at verse 29, a very, very familiar portion of Scripture, one of those Scriptures that God continually convicts us and convinces us, doesn't condemn. Remember, the Holy Spirit never condemns. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but he'll convict and convince us of. It's found in verse 29. Paul is writing, he said, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, that which edifies, that which ministers grace to that one who is listening to you. Now, I'm going to show you something, and if you've uh, got any premarital counseling from me, you know that I've shared with you the number one reason for divorce in a marriage. Do you want to know what it is? It is a lack of communication. It is the root of money problems. It is the root of sexual problems, and I'm talking about in that marriage. It is the root of disciplinary problems when it comes to the kids where there's no communication between the husband and the wife or there is a different way of doing things because they've never come together and talked about it and agreed on it. Uh, there is the, the problem with um, trying to, to get your way or get a point across instead of just coming together and just communicating and making sure that you have compromised or whatever you got to do to make sure that you get it right, um, that's not happening in a marriage. Not only is there a lack of communication, but there is uh, the way that we communicate that has gone off the deep end. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's, there's those that will communicate with yelling, We think that the louder we are, the more likely we are to get our point across. Then there are those that will communicate with angry and hurtful words, thinking that I've got to tear you down, make sure that you hurt worse than I do. We have those who communicate with violence. They will throw objects or they'll use their strength 
uh, uh, especially one that's stronger on the one that is weaker. Now, we have those that will communicate with silence. They will go days and weeks without talking. Now, ladies, I'm going to tell you something. Men don't mind. So if you think you're getting something over on your husband, you're not. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. There's other ways of communicating as a woman will, most of the part is the women, sometimes it's men, will communicate by withholding sex. Still others will communicate by driving away when they get into an argument. And mostly the men will get into their car and they just go for a ride. If you're not serving God, you'll probably end up at a bar, come home drunk. However you want to do that, but that's how a lot of men will communicate. Now, church, I'm going to tell you that all these methods of communication end up being destructive instead of constructive. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some time ago, it was 2013 when I shared this message for you that have been here for that long. My goodness, I've been here for nine and a half years, going on 10 years at Calvary Assembly. Uh, But if you remember, um, I talked about psychologists scientists that begin to do some research. And they begin to talk about what happens to the blood when suddenly you're faced with a fight or an argument or there's, you're getting mad changes. And this, this is true. Uh, changes begin to take place in the body. And what happens is the blood literally flows from the brain into the body, we call that adrenaline. And that's going to help you either fight or flee. Now, here's what scientists say. When the blood leaves the brain, you get certifiably dumber. How many remember when I said, when I talked about this? Does anybody remember this? Only a few. So in other words, if you're a genius, and they talk about you literally losing like 20 points, 20 IQ points. That's how much blood will leave the brain, go into the body, and that adrenaline is going to help you fight. Or that adrenaline is going to help you flee. So they're saying that when that blood leaves the brain, you literally lose or you drop 20 IQ points. This means that if you're a genius, before you got mad, when you get mad, you're an average thinker. Now, how many geniuses do we have here today? All right, then the next one is for you. Here it is. <laughs> if you're of average intelligence before you got mad, after you get mad, you become an imbecile. Now, remember when I told you, if you were here and you remember this message, I said, you need to write this down, put it on your fridge, put it on the first page of your Bible, write it on your forehead, put it over the doorpost of your home. I don't care where you put it, but here's what you need to write down. When I am mad, I am stupid. (laughs) Now, when is a good time to fight? Not when you're stupid. A good time to fight is when all the brain is still filled with blood. Because the moment that blood leaves, church, you're going to do some completely stupid things. And this is why after a fight, did you ever say this? Why did I say that? Do you want to know why you said that? Because you were stupid. (laughs) Or others will say, oh, I just thought of something I should have said. Do you want to know why you didn't say it? Somebody got it. I heard somebody say, because you were stupid. Here's what I'm saying, church. The best way to communicate when there's serious problems and issues in that family is not when you're stupid. Now, listen, God gives us some great ways to do it. But we're not doing it right. We're not doing it his way. And I'm going to give you two perfect things that you you need to be doing when it comes to um, the different things that you're faced with in a, when it comes to couples. Number one, don't let the problem fester. 
I love just a couple of verses earlier, Paul saying, in your anger, do not sin. And then he says this, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, how many have heard the analogy of the teapot? Nobody's heard that analogy. You put a, a pot of tea on the stove, and that pot can handle the heat for so long. But after a while, it'll get hot enough where that pot will begin to sing. And that's how many of us are handling problems today. We're letting things go and go and go. And the whole time on the inside, we are simmering, church. And finally, we get to the end, and we explode. And when we explode, what's happening? We are now dumber. We are more, more stupid when we do it this way. And so we say things and do things we would never have normally done when we would have all the blood in the brain. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? And here's what God is saying. Listen, whatever has come between you and your family member, you don't let it fester. That's how you make a, a mountain out of a molehill. And I'm going to tell you, that's how you give the devil a foothold in that marriage is when you won't talk about it, but you let it bother you and bother you and bother you until you go boom. And church, we can't do it that way. The Bible is telling us, listen, don't, don't address the issue when you're in your court low in your IQ. Address it immediately. Don't let the sun go down before you address it. And it doesn't matter who started at church. The moment you realize that you become the one to take the initiative and get it fixed. Amen? Amen. Secondly, and I think this is really important, and I, man, I really felt the presence of the Holy Spirit as I was putting this together. And this was something that I talked about a long, long time ago, and it was this. Talk to God before you talk to that other person. Now, why am I saying that? Philippians 4, 6, I'm sure you've got this underlined in your Bible. Here's what Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. And then he says this, in everything, everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, why are we doing that? Well, I'm going to tell you why. It's because most of us do not have the right words to say. The words that we'll speak, if they're not given properly, have, will have the opposite effect. And this is why you're going to God. God, I need the right words. I need words that are seasoned with grace. I, I've got to have the ability to speak truth, but I've got to do it in love. Remember that the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are what? In the power of the tongue. So you've got to understand that it's not about throwing another log on the fire, because that's what most of us do. And God tells us that where there is no wood, there is no fire, but not couples. Man, we just take it and we throw another log on the fire. We just keep that fight going and keep that fight going. Why? Because we're not taking it to the Lord first. We're not asking God to give us the words that we need to speak over this. We've got to put the fire out, not throw another log on it. You see, you've got to let God speak through you. Because the words that we speak on our own most of the time not all the time. Sometimes God will give us some wisdom and we'll say it the right time in the right way. But I tell you, a lot of times, church, we're really speaking the wrong thing. Let God give you revelation. Let God give you understanding. Let God give you the right words. Because when you speak it, he says this, my words will go out. It'll accomplish that which I sent it out to accomplish. It will not return void. Oh, did you catch that? That's why you need his word. But I'm going to tell you another thing you need. You need to let God check your motive. What's your motive? 
Because it needs to be about getting things right and not about being right. Would you mind if I say that again? Our motives need to be about getting things right, not being right. If this thing is about you winning this battle, if this is about you lording over your spouse, because you know I'm right, that's the wrong motive. It's not about being right. It's about getting things right. Can you say amen to that? And as you speak, church, I'm going to tell you, God will give you the words of life to bring life where there is death. Let me give you one more powerful point here. Renew your commitment to believe God. Mark 11, if you'll turn there with me, again, this will be very familiar. Again, I'm sure that you have this underlined in your Bible. Mark chapter 11. Jesus has cursed the fig tree. It has withered. So the disciples come to him astonished. Verse 22 of Mark 11, Jesus answers them. And he says, number one, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have faith whatsoever he saith. Now, I want you to hear me for a moment because this is the most practical aspect of everything that I'm talking about here this morning. Every marriage, please listen to this, every marriage, every family is going to experience difficulties. Nobody's exempt from that. Um, We've got honeymooners here Uh, Joshua and Chloe, congratulations to you. It was so good to do your wedding. But I warned them, didn't I? I warned them that the honeymoon will one day be over. And that isn't something that, you know, that you say flippantly. It's just making young couples realize that there is a honeymoon period, uh, that there is a time, a season where everything is good, and suddenly the relationship is tested. And it's tested through trials and tribulations and through hardships and things that will come your way. And that, that couple then will have to learn how to deal with that. Remember Jesus said in John 16, in this world you're going you're to have tribulation. But then he also said, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. So what do we do then when these challenges come? What do we do when we're in the middle of a season of difficulty? Well, for sure that we hang on to God, don't we? We put our faith in God. We trust God. We look for God to work all things out together for our good. But I want to share a story with you that I have seen God do over and over again. And it has to do with me and Sharon. So I'm not going to talk about any other couple here this morning. I'll talk about us. It has been so interesting to me to see how God has worked in our lives and in the midst of these very difficult situations. Every single time, and I mean, Sharon and I have been faced with some very serious things in life. Um, It has not been a cakewalk for us at all. We've not lived the life like some tipping through the tulips, tiptoeing through the tulips, I should say. I mean, we've faced some real hardships like many of you have, so I'm not saying feel sorry for me. I'm just telling you that Our life has not been a bed of roses. But every single time that something has happened, and this has been since we've been serving the Lord, God has always set it up to where one in that couple is extremely strong in that moment in their faith. In other words, there's been times where something will happen And I've been very weak at that moment, and I'm trying to come to grips with what's going on, and I'm working my way through it, and yet Sharon's faith will have increased. Uh, It'll be huge, large, and man, I'll grab her coattails, and man, I said, all right, Sharon, come on, walk me through this thing. Let's, Let's get through this. And her faith and her words have just been so powerful and brought us through, and there's been times 
where she's been weak in the faith, and, but God has supernaturally increased my faith in that moment. And so I'll say, honey, listen, let's believe God. Let's put our faith in Him and trust Him, and this is going to work out, and we're going to get through this, and she'll grab my coattails, and we'll ride our way through this issue. Now, here's what I'm saying, church. I'm saying this, that when something happens in your marriage, you become that conduit of faith. You be the one that says, okay, listen, hop on board, because I'm going to believe that God's going to move this mountain. You be the one that begins to speak life and speak the words of faith. Speak the promises of God. Listen, you be the one that says, okay, I'm going to be the carrier of faith in this moment for my family. Something happens to your kids and your spouse is weak in that moment. Oh, trust me, church. God is so beautiful and so wonderful that he'll increase faith in somebody in that family. And I've seen it every single time. It has never, never failed. How many know what I'm talking about? It has been amazing to watch God work in our marriage and our family, even when there are those that are weak and struggling. You might be full of doubt. You might question God, God, how are we going to get through with this? But I'm going to tell you, God will impart faith supernaturally. The gift of the Spirit will be released in that moment. And that spouse will become so strong that they'll become the carrier for that family to help that family make it through it. Be the carrier, church. You be the one that carries that couple, carries that marriage, carries that family. You say, well, pastor, I'm the only one serving the Lord. My spouse doesn't serve God. Or you might well say, well, pastor, um, I, I'm single. What do I do then if I'm single? I don't have somebody to carry this when I'm weak. I, I just don't have a spouse that I can hang on to the coattails. That's great for you, pastor. But what about me? Well, I'm going to give you the answer to it. And I'm going to read some scripture verses in a moment that will help me solidify what I'm saying. If you're the only one in that marriage or you're the only one in that family, here's what you do. You go to the church. You go to your accountability partner. Now, church, we've been hammering this in our step studies as we prepare to start Celebrate Recovery. And you're, you're, if you're married, your accountability partner, your number one accountability partner ought to be your spouse, period. But if you uh, needed some other friendships and those that will speak into your life, there's nothing wrong with that at all because iron sharpens iron. I have wonderful pastor friends that I will go to and bounce things off and get counseling and have them pray for me. I don't take it to the people, but I will take it to those that I have made accountability partners for myself. Of course, my wife knows first, but I have no problem going to others. And church, everybody ought to have that in the church. If you're single, you and I ought to have somebody that will sharpen you or challenge you or will uh, pray with you or help carry your burden. That scripture, Galatians 1 or Galatians 6, verses 1 and 3 tells us that there's burdens that we have to learn how to carry ourselves, but then there's burdens that we are to bear together. And there's no reason why you cannot pick up that phone or go to church and go to that person that you've connected with and say, listen, I need prayer. And accountability partner, listen. Friends, listen. When somebody comes up to you and begins to share this need, they need you to become the carrier of faith. Listen, the Holy Spirit gives the gifts of the Spirit when they're needed. Let faith begin to well up in you and begin to speak over the life. Speak God's Word 
in that moment. Lay your hands on them and begin to unite in prayer, believing that God is going to bring them through this. They need somebody, church, that will help them through the problem and the issue. And that's where the church family comes in. And that's where we stand with each other and believe God for each other. Can you say amen to that? You're awful quiet this morning. Let me share this scripture verse with you. I love these verses. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation as I prepare to end. Listen to what Solomon says. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple-braided cord is not easily broken. Who is the three in my marriage? I'm going to tell you, my wife and Jesus, number one. And we can face anything together. We can face any mountain, any obstacle. It doesn't matter, church. We can face it. And if I'm weak, God will make sure that she is strong. And when she is weak, God will make sure in that moment that I am strong. It's just how God created it. Two have become one. And God does that for a reason. That's why I love the words of Jesus in Matthew 18, 19. If two of you agree here on this earth, touching anything that you ask, my Father which is in heaven will do it for you. Can you say amen to that? Does this make sense, church? Let me conclude with this. Now, there's a tendency to walk out after these messages, and the first words out of your mouth is, I suck. (laughs) I'm the worst parent in the world. I'm the worst Christian. I'm the worst believer. My family is so broken. There's no way of ever seeing my family get back together and be whole. Listen, church, listen. I am never sharing this to beat anybody up. I don't want you walking out thinking, man, I'm the worst. All I'm doing is the challenge and saying, listen, even if you got 10% better, isn't that better than where you were? Even if you did one thing, isn't that better than doing nothing? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Even if you started trying, isn't that better than not trying? I'm not telling you that you got to be perfect. I'm not telling you that things are going to change overnight. No, it's not going to. I understand that. This is not a magic wand. I'm not going to wave it here this morning. And man, you're going to walk out and say, wow, things have changed. No, but I'm going to tell you that you can do things to cause that change. God will help you, church. Do you believe that today? So I'm not saying there's a perfect family. I've never met the perfect family. I've never met that. But I'm going to tell you, you can have good families. Man, I only had one amen. (laughs) Let me say it again. You can have good families. All right, you're awake. You can have godly families. You can have united families. Families that are going after God. I know that can happen. How about families that are are under the divine favor and blessings of the Lord? You watch what happens when you renew that commitment to Christ and serving Him. You watch. Again, it doesn't come by accident. You're going to have to work at it. You've got to do your part. But I'm going to tell you, if you do, you will set your family up. You'll become the umbrella 
of all that God wants to do with that family. And God will pour out the blessings that will overcome and overtake you. And that's what we want for our families. Can you say amen to that? But here's the point. We're at the crossroads. We've got to make a decision. You cannot wait. You cannot waver. You've got to do it now. If we keep going down this same path as a church, as a people, and I'm talking about the path of the world, the path of self, the path of our own understanding, and we keep rejecting this manual for life we call the Bible, we'll see the same things happening. I'm going to tell you that we're at the insanity moment as a family. And here's what God is saying. If you'll take the right road, then you'll experience the peace and the blessings that God intended every family to live under. Can you say amen? Amen. And this is just a part of those keys and what I'm sharing. And I've asked the Lord, Lord, I want to be as practical as I can through this series. And I believe that God has allowed me to do that. This is not some new revelation. I'm not pulling a rabbit out of the hat. I'm just taking God's word. I'm opening it up and I'm sharing it with you and saying, listen, we can do this and we can do it together and we can turn death to light.